or 200 games to help a child with special needs gain fundamental social skills and regularly publishes on the Generation Rescue blog, Autism File Magazine. Also the founder of the Autism Empowerment Tele Summit initiative that has on its panel experts from around the world like Temple Grandin. She has also presented at the National Autism Association Conference in 2017 on autism and self-esteem. It's an honor to welcome Tally Berman, who will be talking to us about autism and the importance of integrative therapies. Um, I think actually the way that these presentations have been scheduled is really appropriate because a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is a really nice overlap with the Cater team who came and spoke about the importance of integrative therapy and integrative treatment. So I'm going to sort of take that topic and go a little further with it. Uh, before I do, I want you to meet two kids. This is Kira, Kira and her mom. She's six years old, diagnosed in the autism spectrum, and she's from the United States. And this is Seaman. He is 12 years old, also diagnosed with the autism spectrum, um, and he's from Scandinavia. And I love how his, he looks like he's in this namaste position, which wasn't even intentional. Now, the reason I'm showing you these two kids here is because I'm going to talk a little bit about an integrative approach and uh, the strategies behind it and how those strategies impacted these two specific kids. So I'm going to circle back to them towards the end and show you how these strategies really made an impact in their growth and their development. So here's what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to define what I mean by integrative care, discuss the problems that can arise when care is not offered in this way, the core concepts of the whole child approach, how these concepts can be applied and the impact they can make with the case studies of the two children I just showed you, and a vision for our larger community. So the definition of integrative is the combining or coordinating separate elements so as to provide a harmonious, interrelated whole. And I think this was talked about just before, um, that it's not just about adding up a lot of different categories, but when things come together, a bigger and greater uh, result occurs. Um, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. By Aristotle is a great way of really capturing that concept. So I want to first start with problems that can arise when care is not provided in an integrated way. And as clinicians who are listening today, you might really be familiar with some of these challenges. So one challenge is limited and or inconsistent results. So you might see a child who really develops in a certain way and then gets sort of stuck at a particular place in their development or makes developmental gains and then loses them and then gains more and then loses them and it's sort of this roller coaster um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. You might see also, if this is for a parent or a clinician, that a child gets stuck in a particular area of development or what looks like a regression occurs. So skills they may have gained, they begin to lose um, and it looks like they're regressing in their development. And the third problem that can arise, and I think this is an interesting one and sort of a nuance that not everybody is aware of, is that when care is not offered in an integrated way, you have a lack of leveraging the development in one area to help create a momentum in the other, so that one really feeds and fuels a whole other area of development that people don't often think are related. And I want to just give you an example of that. This is a quote by John J. Rady. Um, from the Harvard Medical School, from the User's Guide to the Brain. And he writes, movement is crucial to every other brain function, including memory, emotion, language, and learning. Our higher brain functions have evolved from movement and still depend on it. Now, movement is something that's been talked about quite a bit today. Um, I know Renee spoke about this earlier, and it's been sort of touched upon through many of the different presentations. And this, I think, is a great example of how movement and focus on movement and the development of movement um, also can really impact things that you might not think they would impact, like attention, communication, um, and a variety of different skills. So when care is not offered in an integrated way, you don't get to benefit from the leverage that one area really can fuel to the other. So with that awareness in mind, seeing that when care is not offered in an integrated way. Um, I partnered up recently with a team, we call ourselves the whole child team. So it's myself, Roni Enten, who's an individualized biomedical nutritionist, Dr. David Berger, who has a clinic in Tampa, Florida, who's a board-certified pediatrician, and Patsy Giarda, who's a board-certified 
pediatric nurse practitioner who works together with Dr. Berger in his uh, Tampa clinic. And we began to work together as a team um, in an interdisciplinary, integrated way to help put these pieces together. So I want to share with you, first of all, what are some of the core concepts of our whole child approach. So core concept number one is that healing underlying medical issues is critical to a child's growth in all areas of development. Um, and this is something that I haven't really heard much about today, so I'm excited to talk about it. Um, the different ways that any time a child is suffering uh, medically, that's going to obviously get in their way of different areas of development and needs to be addressed first and foremost so that a child can be available to learn and process. I think, Jackie, you spoke about stress and how stress and, the, and cortisol impacts and makes it so that a child really isn't available to learn. And similarly, when a child's really not feeling well, just like any of us who have a toothache or a headache, aren't available, we're sort of occupied in using our energy to take care of ourselves and cope, uh, making it unavailable to, to learn. So deep and meaningful growth is impossible. If a child is suffering from, and these are just some of the many things that a child might be suffering from, gut inflammation, which can be caused by chronic diarrhea or constipation, and we're going to talk about that a little bit in one of my case studies, um, hyperactivity, which could be caused by dysregulation, or brain and nerve dysfunction, which can be a cause of malnutrition, toxicity, amongst other things. And some of the core areas that can be addressed when doing a biomedical intervention are things like refining and optimizing a diet, gastrointestinal support, immune and allergy support, heavy and metal detoxification, oxidative stress management, nutrigenomics DNA methylation and assessment, adrenal support, and environmental toxicity and inflammation support. And actually, I just want to share one piece about the heavy metal piece. Um, I'm currently working with a family in Denver who has two children. She has two sons on the autism spectrum. And one of her older sons was going through a period, quite a long period, where he was having very irritable behavior, was very sound sensitive, would cry at almost anything, um, was very fatigued and very non-socially engaged, more so than usual. And this is a, a mom who's very knowledgeable about the different kinds of biomedical interventions. And she did a test to test for heavy metals. Um, and I think I was just talking about it with you, Steve, about metals and, and, and the impact it can make. So she had found that he had an extraordinary high level of lead. Um, they, called him, they called her right away from the clinic to say that he had a very high level of lead um, and that he needed to immediately do a chelation to help cleanse his body of the lead. They also had to identify what the source of that lead was. Um, they had the health agency come into the school and come to the home. She changed all the hardware in her home. Um, but they did find in the school playground that the soil had a very high level of lead. And this was a kid who'd spent a lot of time playing in the soil, putting it into his mouth. And so the school had to address that. And he's now been pulled out of school and is going through a chelation process. It's still early on. It's about a three-month process. Um, but these will absolutely affect his development and his neurological growth and must be addressed for further growth to occur. So when the power of integrative care is when you have the biomedical interventions in place, you're healing the underlying medical issues, and then able to really address and create a therapeutic plan working on social skills, communication skills, and independent life skills. And this healing and learning process combined to make the most powerful and rich criteria, like fertile soil, for a child to actualize his or her true potential. And this takes me to uh, core concept number two. The core concept number two of the whole child approach is attention to all six aspects of development. All six aspects of development is essential for whole child growth. So what we've seen, I think this was also talked about briefly in the previous presentation, is that, and I've seen this with many kids, that there might be a hyper-focus on things like communication. And a whole team of specialists are working to help a child become more verbally communicative. And they realize down the way that this child has not developed any independent life skills, that his academic skills have really been neglected. Um, oftentimes, there are very critical areas of development that have been neglected with a hyper-focus on a very splintered skill. So part of the whole child approach is, number one, healing any underlying medical issues that can result in any of the symptoms or challenges you might see in autism. 
But it's also having awareness of what these six aspects are and really addressing and giving them attention to really promote whole child growth. So I'm going to get into those six aspects. This is the whole child approach. You'll see health and vitality is central. Um, that always comes first and foremost. Um, the first one is social skills. The second one is communication. The third one is education. Uh, aspect number four is motor skills, really motor and movement. The fifth one is independent life skills. Well, I liked what Wen said today about interdependence, which I think I'm going to add to that as a concept. And the sixth one is emotional well-being. Um, and so what I'm going to do right now is sort of zoom in onto each one of these aspects and just talk a little bit about some of the highlighted areas that we focus on within each aspect when working with a child. Hold on, did I skip one? No, the first one. Okay, the first one is social skills. So there's a couple of things I want to highlight or sort of spotlight in the area of social skills. Um, one is engagement with family members and peers, obviously, but this one really, really, I think, is an important one because families will oftentimes come to me and say that what they want more than anything else is for their child with autism to play with their neurotypical sibling. It's something that doesn't happen. They kind of ignore each other at best. And every, par every parent um, gets such deep gratification from seeing their children play together and have a relationship together. And that really can be uh, very painful for parents when that doesn't happen. So that's a really important area that we focus on, is creating those relationships within the family and also relationships uh, with peers. Besides those sort of intimate one-on-one -on -one relationships, it's also helping creating opportunities that develop the sense of belonging that comes from being a part of a group. And so I know we've talked about in different ways today the importance of the inclusion. Um, oftentimes, children with autism can be very isolated. And so the importance of really integrating them in whatever way is appropriate, because that sense of belonging is something that we may take for granted, just being a part of our schooling system or our jobs, that can really be lacking for someone um, on the autism spectrum. And the last piece is, of course, the specific social skills that you would teach a child, like turn taking and working together. Um, the second area of communication, I want to just highlight some things here. One is comprehension and following directions. And I wanted to share about this because there's sort of two parts to communication. There's being on the production end, you know, verbal production or production through typing or um, letterboarding. But also there is the receiving end and really being able to demonstrate comprehension. And both of those are an important part of a relationship around communication. And again, there's usually a hyper-focus on the verbal production piece, understandably so. Um, but then the piece of comprehension is really sometimes skipped altogether. And this, there's a story of a family I worked with from Ireland, a little boy named Cameron, who had been stuck in his verbal production. They were trying to get him to use more words to communicate. He had sort of some isolated words. And the parents were getting frustrated, and the kid was getting frustrated. And I asked them if they'd ever worked on comprehension skills and following directions, and uh, they never had. And they began to shift their focus. They began to then focus on him following directions, one-step directions, two-step directions, and he rose to the occasion like instantly. He was so excited to have the opportunity to show what he could do after such a long time focusing on the areas where he was really the most challenged, and it created a real momentum in his growth. He even began to initiate things like when they would go out on an outing, without even having to ask him to get his shoes on or bring the keys, he would do it on his own. So focusing on the comprehension aspect is also a really important part of communication. Of course, there's gestures, body language, and verbal production. Um, and I also really want to highlight alternative forms of communication, such as typing or using a letter board. That is something that is becoming more and more um, brought to the attention of the autism community. And people who were really thought before of having very limited capacity on an intellectual level, who didn't have the skills, who were either nonverbal or very minimally verbal, through the use of, a ty of typing or using a letter board, have really gotten their voice, so to speak, and are able to communicate in the most insightful and expressive ways what their experience of autism is, what their experience in their life is, what the things they want for themselves. So I think it's important, too, when we talk about communication, that we think about it in really broad and creative terms and um, make strategies that are really specific to each particular child. Education. So this is something I say, if I, if I could scream anything from the rooftops, both within the autism community and outside the autism community, it would be this, which is a child's level of verbal communication means nothing about their level of comprehension. 
So I think it's very easy to assume that if a child has limited verbal skills, can maybe spit out a couple of words, that he must not understand all that much. And so they have repeated activities of where's your nose and where's your head and where's your nose and where's your head over and over again until a child sort of blows their top, gets aggressive, and no one can understand why. Um, and often it's because, and we've heard now ch children who communicate, and, and Seaman is one of them, through typing, how he knows where his head is. He knows where his nose is. His challenging is being able to organize his body to demonstrate that knowledge, but he was really eager for much higher education. Um, the mother then began to work with him and teach him textbooks that are peer level, textbooks that other kids in his school were learning. And he began to learn about cell division, and he began to learn about astronomy, and he began to learn about puberty. And when she asked him, was it really boring, when I kept talking to you, when you were learning all the sort of rote, repetitive stuff that we were teaching you before, he pointed to the word yes, yes, you know, like with exclamation points. He just really wanted to learn. So I think teaching to a child's true intelligence uh, is really an important piece here. Motor skills um, and movement. So again, this is something that's been touched about in a couple of different ways. And I want to talk about it in two different aspects. Um, one is the physical activity. So making that a daily part of a child's schedule in whatever way is motivating and fun for that child. So we saw also in the video of the ashram, whether it's biking or running or for a lot of kids really into rock climbing, horseback riding, swimming, the importance of having those activities um, both for the development of their balance, but also coordination, strength building. It's also an incredible release of anxiety, which we know many of the kids on the spectrum really are challenged with. So that's one aspect. But the other aspect, too, is incorporating very specific movement programs, um, like a program called Reflex Integration. There's different programs about this um, that are designed specifically to mature the brain and develop higher level thinking. Um, and I'll just tell you a personal experience around this. I have a 11-year-old son who is not on the autism spectrum, but does have some, some pretty big learning challenges, including uh, basic kind of dyslexia. And we tried everything, you know, vision therapy and reading specialists and occupational therapy. And, you know, he got all kinds of support at school. And he would make sort of very small strides. Um, but then I incorporated with him a very specific movement program. Um, if anyone's interested, it's called, there's a website called Move, Play, Thrive. A woman named Sonia Story has developed a, a program that is rhythmic movements um, as well as reflex integration. And I began to do that program with him along with another program. And so without addressing reading itself, but focusing on a movement program, his brain began to mature in different ways. It helped him with his eye tracking. He would always lose his place when he was reading. It helped him with his pairing, his eyes, um, when he was reading, with his attention. He is now, right now, actually, for the first time, reading a book front to back with no pictures, which is a really big deal for him, because anytime he'd look at a page of text and just see straight text, he'd get immediately overwhelmed and not want to do it. Um, so there's some really interesting and important ways that movement can really impact a child's development in sometimes really unexpected ways. Oops, hold on a second. Uh, independent life skills. So in the area of independent life skills, um, part of it is to, for a child to actually learn that specific skill. That's an important thing for any child to learn in, over the span of their lives, whether it be to use the bathroom by themselves, take a shower by themselves. Um, but it's also an opportunity to develop pride, confidence, and the empowerment that comes from doing things on your own. Um, there's a boy that I'm working with right now from Brooklyn who is nine years old, who also right now communicates primarily through uh, using a letter board. And he communicated how much he wants to learn how to use the bathroom totally by himself. And his goal is to go to summer, a summer sleepaway camp. He wants to go to a summer sleepaway camp, and he knows that in order to do that, he's got to get to the bathroom, go to the bathroom, pull down his pants, pull up his pants. We were just talking about the sequence earlier today. Um, washing his hands and doing that all on his own. He initiated that. He was able, thank God, to communicate that. There are a lot of kids who can't communicate. But that's something they want for themselves. Um, so the importance of really helping a child develop those independent life skills. 
um, and activities that facilitate becoming a contributing member of the family or community. So again, the importance of a child belonging, of having a sense of contribution, whether it be helping with the shopping or the cooking or, or taking care of a pet, those are all important parts of independent life skills that all contribute to this last category, which is emotional well-being. Emotional well-being, what I mean by that is uh, self-esteem or having a positive sense of self. And this, in my opinion, is the most neglected area and one that is most important for all kids. I gave a talk uh, last year in New Orleans at the National Autism Conference just on self-esteem. Um, and this is especially important for children with autism who are often grossly misunderstood, underestimated, excluded, and stigmatized. And so the idea is, is that although there are these six different aspects of the whole child approach, that of course there's overlap and one's going to feed into the other. So for example, in terms of emotional well-being, as you begin to teach to a child's true intelligence, they begin to feel more empowered. They see that you see them as someone who's capable of higher level learning. As you help a child learn independent life skills, that also feeds into their sense of empowerment and a positive sense of emotional well-being. So it's not like you need to have six different goals and six different strategies that you're working on in different ways at the same time, but bringing the intention that by working on one, you're also feeding it into another, that's feeding into another, again, to create growth in the whole child. Okay, so we're gonna go back to these two cute kids again. So, Here's Kira and her mom. She's so cute. Let me tell you about her. So, oh, I see this is a bit of an outdated slide, so I'm just gonna see what I can remember here. When Kira came to us, um, she was pretty severely constipated. She was making a bowel movement every four to six days, and when she would, it was only with the help of a suppository. Um, and because she was so constipated, she would have frequent accidents. Um, possibly because of the pressure of, of her bowels that compacted over that time. So we first began to make some changes in her diet, some simple changes in her diet um, and supplements. I'm not going into the details of it, but one of the main things that made the biggest impact was just some introduction of some fruits. She had some very, very limited uh, diet and had almost no fiber in her diet at all. She went from making a bowel movement every four to six days with the help of a suppository to going every single day totally independently. Now, there's so many different amazing things about that, besides the fact of her health, um, but relieving her discomfort, um, giving her an ability to attend and be available in different ways. But her mom also expressed that usually, if anyone who's used a suppository with a child know, it is often a very challenging experience. There's a lot of power struggle in there. And to eliminate that as a power struggle between them was really a huge shift for the whole family. She began to fall asleep in half the time it took her before. She began eating new foods, which of course is, is, can be a challenge for many kids and was a very exciting development for them. So what began to happen is her health began to be more balanced. We were healing underlying medical issues. She became more relaxed, she became happy. As you can imagine, being that constipated will cause a lot of irritability, a lot of moods, a lot of behaviors. And then she became available to learn. She became available to grow. Um, so as I was saying before, one of the things that mom really wanted was for her and her little sister, Donica, to start playing together. They had never played together before. So now, Kira was available. And we would created a whole structure around playtime with her sister in the evenings with very specific facilitated activities. And he began playing together for the first time. Um, she learned how to take turns. Uh, she learned how to have the attention span within a game. She also became much less aggressive, so Kira was a kid who would scream and pinch every single day. Now that she was feeling better, now that she was more calm, we were able to then put in a plan to really help her, um, and those behaviors really completely disappeared. She also began using fuller sentences, including nouns and verbs. Um, and so Kira is, I think, a great example of how when you introduce the biomedical piece and really heal those issues, and then introduce a therapeutic plan to address some of those important pieces amongst those six aspects in the whole child approach, then there's a whole different kind of growth that can occur. And semen, let me say about semen for a second. Hold on, move back one. Uh, so semen is an interesting case because besides having autism, 
He was also diagnosed with PANDAS, and for anyone who's not familiar, that's a pediatric autoimmune disorder. Um, which has some symptoms that are very similar to autism, so they can be very confused, and some kids have both. So what happened with Seaman, he was the one I was telling you about before, that um, his mother started teaching him at a much higher level. He went from really, she would read him these toddler books about fire engines and fire trucks, um, to really teaching him textbooks about, you know, very high-level science. He began to communicate more, he was expressing himself more, he was cooking in the kitchen, which he was so excited about, making apple pies and making apple cakes, he was really growing into himself. Um, and what would happen with him is when he would have a pandas outbreak, which was I mean, when he would get sick, for any other kid that might just look like a fever, you get sick, you get better and sort of get back on track. But for semen, those kind of flare-ups would turn into OCD-style behaviors, tics, um, and most importantly for him, self-injurious and aggressive behaviors. And so he would do a lot of lashing out, a lot of scratching, a lot of pinching. This was, of course, very challenging for the family and very challenging for him. He would communicate afterwards the kind of remorse he would feel, the kind of guilt he would feel about acting this way to people he loved because he really wasn't in control of his body. And so this would be a huge setback for the family. This would be a huge setback for Seaman. It would take some time to sort of gather himself back up and stop beating himself up and carry on and to develop uh, further in his growth. So when a biomedical intervention plan was added here, um, he was put on a specific vitamin regimen that not only helped those outbreaks happen much less frequently, but when they did occur, they occurred with a lot less uh, intensity, and he was able to move through it more quickly, which allowed him to stay on track with his development and continue to gain skills versus gaining skills and then going all the way back and having to move himself back forwards again. So this takes me to our, my vision for our community. This is the community here that we have here today. Um, to come together as a community of professionals like we are right now, to collaborate and learn from each other, and to offer the most integrative approach possible. In doing this, we can know that we are giving each child a true opportunity to actualize their absolute potential. So I want to thank you all. Thank you, Vijay and the, and the whole Ketter team for gathering us all together. It's really been an honor to be here.